Hello and welcome, young people of the internet, to the penultimate, the second to last episode of Bright and Early for this semester. We're so glad you're here, and we're, I'm Rachel Davison Humphreys. Uh, I'm Director of Outreach at the Bill of Rights Institute, and as always, I am joined by my delightful colleagues, Gary and Kirk. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. How are you? And we are here today to talk about a word, a concept, something very near and dear to all of us, which is the idea of public space. And what that means, because, I mean, as we're entering month three, is that we in third month, guys? <laughs> I don't know, time doesn't make sense anymore. I don't, it's all timey-wimey, um, in the words of a famous doctor. And, <laughs> and, and so we're, we're starting to recognize that there are there are restrictions on our lives now that may or may not be taken off in the next couple of couple of weeks, depending on where you are in the country, depending on where you are in a state, um, and then what restrictions will be put in place once you're allowed to go back, and what the implications and philosophy and legality of all of that is. So we wanted to take a moment and really think about this word public, and what it means and where it comes from, and what it means culturally. Uh, so first is just the definition of the word. If you're not familiar with the online etymology dictionary, it is it has a special tab in my life uh, because I delight in this resource because it focuses on looking at the, the, the etymology or the history of the word through the language. Um, so for instance, the word public, from the Old French, it was first in English in the 14th century, it comes from the Old French, which comes from the Latin, just meaning of the people or pertaining to the people. But in our modern context, it, it started to evolve, right? So it's not just there are public spaces that are publicly owned, but then there are also public spaces that are privately owned. And we'll work through some of this throughout our, throughout our conversation today. But the idea being that to be, to be public means to be accessible. And I think that idea of access and then the, the associated idea of like community that comes from things being accessible is kind of where we'll go today. And as always, um, Kirk is going to start us off, but I actually, I forgot to check in with you guys. So Kirk, how are you guys doing? We're good. Yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful day here today. Uh, so hopefully it's a beautiful day while you're watching this, but uh, it's like 70 and sunny. And so getting outside is very top of mind for me today. Uh, right after this recording. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How about you? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a certain, um, I'm doing okay to answer your question. And I think part of that is having the ability a little bit to, to change space a little bit. Um, you know, for a while there, changing space for me was changing rooms. Um, and then uh, I've discovered, I discovered I owned a hammock. And now I'm realizing that just the simple change of, of scenery, quite literally, um, is having a pretty positive effect on me. That's awesome. I, I have plans for hammock time this afternoon myself. I have a... <laughs> I have a date with my my blue hammock. Um, well, <laughs> so, Kirk, I am I am jealous. Were, oh yeah, you yeah. know, but you do have a very nice porch. I do I have a porch. Know. I own multiple hammocks. I just have nowhere to hang them, so uh, oh, wow. I will you not be hanging out uh, this afternoon. But uh, taking a whole other turn. Okay. Yeah. Hanging out. But um, speaking of places to hang out, yes. Uh, Rachel, you wanted to talk about public places. I and want so, to talk about public places, and when we want to talk about the history of things in yeah. America, we turn to Kirk Higgin. Yeah, that's right. So I don't know if that's a wise choice, but it's the choice we make. So uh, you know, thinking about public places. So it's interesting. Public parks uh, are, are a relatively new concept on an older idea. Um, and the older idea um, comes from this idea of commons. And so earlier, Rachel was talking about different ways of thinking about the word public. Um, sometimes we think of public ownership. Um, that can mean lots of people own it, or it can mean that the government, which we, the people control, owns something. And so that's public. Uh, but then um, there's another way of thinking about group shared things, which is um, having things in common. Um, and so this word commons 
was actually um, used to talk about different types of land or resources um, that were shared in communities. Particularly thinking about this, it goes back to um, the Middle Ages um, in feudalism and thinking about that the manorial lord would own his estates um, and there would be a place on that estate where uh, the, the peasants could share um, in a certain parcel of that land in order to gather resources. So that was called the common. Um, and so I have a very quick definition here, but land owned in common or over which individuals have certain traditional rights. And so those traditional rights are the ability for them to graze their cattle, for instance, um, on the common land or to go out. Um, I have cutting turf here only because it's a strange concept, but turf could be cut um, for lots of different reasons, one of which um, is to for, for heating homes. Um, so you can go out and cut turf off of a bog that would be dried and heated uh, and, and burned as uh, fire. So that could be something, collecting wood, um, all kinds of things like that were all took place on the common. And so one who uses that is a commoner. Um, and so that's a phrase that we, um, that we often hear, but if you're using the common, um, you are a commoner. Um, and that was all shared uh, for the common good. So um, in the constitution it says promote the general wealth, welfare. Um, but another way of thinking about that is promoting the common good. It's something we use in our um, democratic lexicon um, or way of speaking all of the time. Um, and that common good means it's something that's shared and it's working toward the benefit of everybody. So if, if we're working towards the common good, we're doing something that's gonna be good for everyone as a whole. Um, but commons also um, have their root in this really interesting economics term, which is the tragedy of the commons. Um, this is a concept that became more popularized in the 1960s as a reference, but actually comes out of the 1830s. Um, and it's this idea when, when you have some bad actors who come in and, and maybe over exploit a common good or over exploit something that's going on. Um, so for instance, at the Bill of Rights Institute, we have a kitchen that we all share. Um, and occasionally, uh, just occasionally, not everybody will do their own dishes. And so those dishes will pile up in the sink. <laughs> Um, and we call that a tragedy of the commons. It's no one person's responsibility. And so then it's kind of nobody's responsibility. Um, so there's some, there's some challenges with, with that common ownership, but it's something to keep in mind. And I, I thought it worth, um, thirst, worth kind of bringing up and thinking about. And so in the context of what we're talking about today, um, the Boston Common um, is one of the first parks in the United States. Um, it dates back to 1634. Um, and a park becomes something that is not just for everybody's common use for whatever they want to use it for, um, but it's more a place for recreation, for gathering together. Um, here we have an image of the Boston Common in 1848. Um, but the Boston Common began as more of a common um, and slowly over time um, transformed into a park. Um, and so it's very famous for um, you know, the several instances during the Revolutionary War, one of which was uh, British soldiers camping out on the Boston Common before they marched off um, the battles of Lexington and Concord. Um, I noted here that in 1830, they banned cattle grazing. Um, and that seemed kind of late to me. So yeah, it's interesting. In, up until 1830, um, there was still cattle grazing, I expect. Yeah, yeah, there was. It was limited to 70 cows, uh, you know, at a time. Um, so it had to be shared just to prevent overgrazing. Uh, but during, during really between 1815 and 1840, uh, there's a huge surge in population in the United States. Um, as industrialization is happening, there's sort of a, a, growing, um, a growing economy that's, that's causing a lot of this population. There's an influx of, of immigrants as well. And so cities along the eastern seaboard really start to, to boom. Not only Boston, but New York, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but this common park space, this common land was seen as a place where people could go and gather and they could, they could um, have recreation, they could meet with one another, they could talk, um, and, and, and it was a common green space in an ever urbanizing environment um, as that green space was going away. So a very famous example of that is Central Park. Um, Central Park was established by an act of the New York State Legislature in 1853. I mean, it was established for the purposes of, of, of health in part. Um, there was um, a desire to have more green space in this ever increasing urbanized um, setting. Um, but it was also to assist in the formation of civil society because again, it was a it was a place where you could go and gather, um, you could go and and march on on behalf of something, you could go and um, you know talk about um, whatever the the goings on of the day were, um, and you could also just go and have a picnic or relax and and, and talk with your fellow citizens and get to know them. Um, and and so Gary, as a resident New Yorker, I was wondering if you had any um, instances of of civil participation uh, uh, in Central Park? 
Uh, absolutely. Now, I, I'm sure you've all been there a number of times, lived right there. Uh, but yes, as a New Yorker, Central Park is something that that is it's it's such a part of your your life you almost i don't want to say take for granted but really appreciate that in the middle of a an incredibly populated urban area where every square inch has great value that it, the, the value of having this green space in the in the literal center of the island is important so you know when you say civic engagement i i think about the, that first sunny day of spring, which may have passed for some time, but we're, we're almost around that time now, when, when many people would descend upon the park for various reasons, whether it is picnics, or whether it is frisbee, or whether it is you know kite flying. And the fact you could have so many people in this public space without, I mean, there are rules, but without having to establish any sort of you know, formal orchestration, people coexist in a really productive way. It's a real example of self-governance, to throw out a phrase we like to talk about, right? To say, like, I'm not going to throw my Frisbee and run across your picnic, or, hey, this is where kites can go. It, it orchestrates, so it's such a pleasant experience for people. So, so when you talk about that, my experiences were always always not stressful, and yet surrounded by so many people, and you would run into folks, and it just it really was just a beautiful opportunity to to have collective civic interactions with people. Yeah, that's I mean it's and that's the power I think of these parks, right? It's it's a place you can go that's outside the the urban hustle and bustle of the densely populated rest of New York. Um, and I really encourage if you're interested in in the history of Central Park, check out um, the Central Park Conservancy's website. They've got some really interesting um, information on there. Um, and more about this guy, Frederick Law Olmsted, who's, who's super interesting. And just one quick thing that I think is fascinating about parks, um, because there was a big upsurge in the building of parks um, in the 1850s. Um, and Frederick Law Olmsted was inspired by what he saw in Europe. Um, but the, the landscape in Central Park isn't necessarily what was native to, um, to the island um, of Man is it Man It is Manhattan Island. It is Manhattan Island. Mm -hmm. Yeah having a little bit of a moment there, but, um, but it's not native to Manhattan Island. It was constructed to look pastoral. Um, and so that whole process of, of what they were creating and how they're creating it and, and that that itself is a part of urbanization, it's a really interesting history. And so I encourage you to check it out. Um, and then one final park um, I wanted to touch on is the, the National Mall. The very um, so special guest in this photo. That's yes, right. Who Here is we that? see uh, that my, my special furry friend, uh, Chief Hopper, uh, on the National Mall exercising um, his right. I'm sure he was protesting something, but uh, the National Mall um, is right in the heart of, of Washington, D.C. in the federal district, um, and it really connects this interesting um, area because it connects the, the legislature and the, the Supreme Court um, on Capitol Hill um, down to where the White House sits. And so our governing structures are all sort of um, connected um, closely by the mall, um, but so are monuments and memorials to things that are significant in United States history. So there is the Washington Monument, the World War II Memorial, and um, the, Lincoln Mon the Lincoln Memorial, and um, Jefferson, and MLK, and it's, it's all right there um, in, a, in a really powerful way, um, as are America's public museums, the Smithsonian um, Institution. Um, those museums also open onto the mall. And um, interestingly, it's really kind of the beating heart of the city, because it's where people go to protest um, and to march on behalf of, of movements. Um, and it's also where people go to um, have cultural moments. And so the Smithsonian oftentimes will have um, events on the mall. Um, I've seen everything from um, the annual book fair, which is amazing, um, to one time I was down there and they were doing a tiny home construction uh, bonanza where a bunch of people were building different tiny homes. Uh, my, favorite, to, my favorite was the recent Apollo 50. Um, that's right, yeah, that yeah, where they- Incredible. Yeah, they projected uh, a, a Saturn V rocket on the side of the Washington Memorial um, so that it looked like um, it was a Saturn V. And then I think they launched it on the day. They did. Um, so that, that was launched. an incredible civic, right. uh, like audio, visual, musical experience. They had seven different screens counting down the launch. And then the, the rocket launched off of the, it, a life-size rocket because it was the same right. height as the monument. It was very, very yeah. cool. Yeah, and I think that's just a really beautiful encapsulation of what parks do, right? It, it is it is the life, it, it's where life can come to show itself. And so there's all of this activity that's going on and all the governing buildings that are around it. But the real expression of that um, it portrays itself on the Washington Mall in this very public 
public place. Absolutely, and and I think one of the things we're we're, we're struggling with right now is kind of what is our role in our public spaces in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so many of us love going to the park, walking our neighborhoods, being out and about in these public spaces, whether they're spaces that are governed by the public or spaces that we have free access to usually. Um, and so I wanted to kind of pivot over to Gary to talk about our responsibility and how we should be thinking about these, these spaces and, and kind of what we can do in these spaces even when we can't physically go to them. Right. Or can do someday. No, absolutely. I, I'm, I, I'm enjoying the, the analysis of the different words we've been using, the word public, the word common, uh, even the word space, ironically, when we just talked about Apollo. Um, and just these ideas of, and even the phrase I had before of taking for granted and to think, you know, a lot of our mindset now is the is the time after this, the time when at some point we, we may be able to do some things more collectively, whenever that may be at some point. Um, but also, you know, we had said right now that there's a certain, there's a certain human healthness to just fresh air, even if you're not around other people, uh, that's really important. Um, and what really struck me uh, at the end of what you were just talking about there, Kirk, I mean, the whole thing struck me. But toward the end, they're talking about these 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 parks or these areas that are that are very specifically designed, like the mall, like Central Park. Is that it's no accident you use the phrase "the beating heart," right? That that it is the center of things. So that got that got me thinking really about you know the value of of these centers that happen. Uh, and so so the phrase another phrase to toss into our lexicon of phrases today is the idea of community maybe communal, maybe common, I don't know, maybe that word's related there somehow. Um, but the idea of these centers, and, and you may live in an area that doesn't have a, an orchestrated park in the middle of it, but I imagine that there are examples of centers um, that, that people do go to for these same purposes. Maybe they're libraries or, I mean, I say computer labs, but if you, if you don't have a computer at home, uh, you may go to these places for, Places, community centers have great value. They offer health services or food services or a place to have sports and recreation or even a place to communicate. Uh, the image I have there, I think of the, the Roman Forum uh, or, uh, or in, in the Athens, Agora. The Agora in Athens. And I think there's something that has been such an important part of our communities to have places with that access that you were talking about, Rachel, right? Where you can, you can come to these things um, and share in a way that isn't isn't necessarily orchestrated, right? You just you you, you again you self govern yourself. Um, but then also there's there's the value to just having open space, right? In the time after all of this, you know, I, I'm wondering, I'm just speculating. Will our view of open spaces stay similar to the way they are now? I don't know right now if you are taking more walks than you used to. Um, I know you both have dogs, so you probably are always been taking walks. But um, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question to ask ourselves, not only now but for the future. And again, I, I do want to stress it is really important that. We're wherever you live is gonna have a different story of its relationship to its open space. And you really should listen to the, the guidance of state, city, and local governments. But, but it also that there is a hope for the future, right? And to think, you know, if there are a way now to get into some open space, mindful to be away from other people, but, but also what that will look like in the months to come. Uh, and so that brings me to, um, that brings me to one of my, my last sort of, uh, um, What's the word that I've been using? Journaling experiences. Um, one of my last observation. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop. Journaling here. and observation. Yes. Journal and observe. I think is what Journal we're doing. I don't know. I don't know what day it is. It's okay. I don't know what day it is. For for this week's journaling and observing, it's, it sort of harkens back to our our one of our first conversations about about local history, and I want to revisit that when it comes to the idea of public spaces, um, because I think there's a, there's a rich way to understand the the communal history of where you live, no matter where you are uh, in our country. Uh, right here, I have a, a map of. Um, 
what becomes Arlington, it's about 100 years ago this map is, this year, uh, around 1920 in Alexandria, the idea of naming this new area Arlington uh, emerges. And, and it's a really interesting way to start digging deeply into the, the common spaces and the common areas that, it's, that, it's, uh, that it was born from. I bring up Arlington because that's the headquarters of BRI, and so it's a place that's familiar to us. But you know, right around where we are, all these big and small parks and areas and, and may I say, uh, cornerstones uh, that one could find. Uh, and so whether or not you're physically going out, I, I encourage you as a local historian, you can check out these public spaces, these communal areas, and an interesting local history um, from the comfort of your own home. I mean, you can start with prompts like, what are the origins of street names and landmarks that are around you that perhaps if you're taking a walk, you're noticing? Are they named after important people and events? Or um, are there other commemorations? Or, or are there important people and events that occur that aren't commemorated um, in, in a way that's so obvious? Uh, one little tip that I found that I, that I encourage you to check out is our National Archives uh, and our US Census Bureau. They both collect not just information about individuals, but also they create maps, maps and records uh, based on data and, and based on things that go way back to our beginning, way back to the 18th century. Uh, and so it's a, it's a really fun way to check out your local area um, and find out what was there uh, and what is there now that commemorates what it looked like. I mean, this goes back to what you're talking about with the Boston Common. And again, you may take for granted just the name of a place in the middle of Boston, but it has this really interesting history and apparently a ban on cows. So, <laughs> um, so I encourage you to find that out for your own neighborhood. Yeah, I think I, I as someone who deeply, deeply appreciates our kind of natural spaces, I do take lots of walks because I do have a dog, um, but, but I think that there's learning more about your local local history, looking at the landmarks like we've here in Washington, D.C., they've converted a lot of um, old uh, police boxes into public art installations that tell you a little bit about the history of the region. And so we're stopping at those more than we were in the past. Right. And learning about more about our neighborhood um, just because we're we're here more. We're, we're in it more. Right. I'm not. I'm not going down to the National Mall nearly as much because I'm staying in my neighborhood because, you know, that's that's what they've asked us to do. So I think that as we as we think about again local history, that's such a great way to frame our our conversation and our research. Um, I also wanted to just talk about the fact that society changes based on the. Um, based on the based on the the desires of the people in the society, right? So the way that we change our culture and our society is something makes the something makes it change, and sometimes those are catastrophes and and pandemics. And so this is not the first time we've had pandemics that make us think about green space and public space differently. This is a great article just from history.com um, from a couple of years ago. It's actually not new. Uh, or it is new now, but it was updated. Um, but it but it was out a couple of years ago. So how pandemics spurred cities to make more green space for people. And you'll actually see that right now, as we speak, there are cities, you may live in one, that's changing the way that they are um, offering public space, changing the, the traffic patterns um, to make it so that people can walk on the streets. Uh, this is a really great marketplace um, article about about with fewer cars on the road, some cities are making space for walking. Uh, and then also, again, think about what Kirk and Gary were saying, like the power of the parks, especially if you live in a city that's critical for the physical, emotional, and mental health. Um, and then what are we going to do next is, is a big question for all of us. Uh, this, is a, this is an article from the New Yorker magazine talking about how public space public space after a pandemic may look very different um, but it's essential because public spaces have a very important function within a democracy both gary and kirk spoke to the kind of spontaneous interactions that happen and the spontaneous governance and the kind of practicing of our democratic principles that happen in those public spaces 
And they also provide the space for one of our most deeply held values, which is the right to, um, the right to, to assembly. And so if we, if uh, there are implications for our very democracy when we are rethinking how, how we engage with public space. And so health, wellness, not only of ourselves, but of our society and of our democracy itself is all embedded with this idea of a public space. So gentlemen, I think we're gonna wrap it up on our penultimate episode. Any thoughts to follow up? Only one, because I think we've, we haven't mentioned one very common uh, phrase when talking about public spaces, which is the public square. Um, and throughout Europe, there's lots of public plazas. Um, there's lots of public areas we're gathering. They're often square in shape. Um, but going to the public square is, I think, a euphemism for um, bringing something to the public square is when you, you just bring it out in the open and you have people talk about it. And I think, you know, I think that there is something embedded in that about our nature as social beings that we want to socialize in a way of, in a place where that happens um, is in the public square, be it six feet apart from each other or not. Um, you know, that kind of thing um, has, has always happened in the past um, and will continue to happen. And it's just, it's amazing to me as we've been sitting here, I'm reflecting on, on just how much goes into that little corner, uh, you know, park down the street that you, you may pass by or go to often um, and, and you don't often stop and, and really think about it. It's funny, my, my parting thought also is thinking about things we have been discussing and, and it spurred a, an idea that we are rethinking how we do everything. And we've been talking about physical places, but I'm also thinking about the word forum again. And I want to extend the opportunity that you can digitally collect uh, and converse with us in a, in a cyber space if you will, um, by connecting through us digitally, through our, our, our websites and our social media channels uh, and through right here. Uh, and so that idea of that need can continue even in a strange digital space, that, um, that it's a new way of having that kind of collection. And as we're wrapping up this season, this time of this kind of episode, we really do wanna hear from you. What have you found valuable? What are you interested in? What can we do better or differently that'll make this all the more interesting to you, young people of the internet? Um, and thank you so much for your time and for everything you're doing in your communities. I'm Rachel, this is Gary and Kirk. Be well, take care, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye.